This is the HAN Network, the leader in local news, sports, arts, and entertainment in southwestern Connecticut. This is your coffee break on the HAN Network. It's Thursday, and welcome to your coffee break on the HAN Network. I'm Rob Adams, Kate Chaplinski with the day off. On today's show, we have information on an accident in Norwalk, video of a demolition in Stratford, and shocking video of an abduction in Bridgeport. Plus, we'll have talking transportation with Jim Cameron. Donald Eng will stop by with Today in History. A.J. Simonowski will have weather and sports, and we'll look at the front pages of our HAN, our HAN Network newspapers. All for this Thursday, October 8th, 2015. Now let's get into the headlines. Dramatic video out of Bridgeport shows a girl escaping what police say is an abduction attempt Monday morning. The clip has made national news and Bridgeport police are asking the public to help them find a suspect. Around 7.15 Monday morning, police responded to a report of an attempted abduction near the corner of Boston and Palisade Avenues. Officers found a 17-year-old girl who told them she was talking to talking to school on walking to school, excuse me, on Boston Avenue when a charcoal gray Toyota Yaris approached. The Toyota is missing the rear bumper, leaving the white styrofoam exposed. The driver of the Toyota lured the victim into her car, then assaulted the teen once she was inside the car. The teen leapt from the Toyota as it went west on Boston Avenue. The driver made a U-turn at Dover Street and drove east on Boston Avenue, continuing into Stratford. The victim described the suspect as a Hispanic female, approximately in her 40s. The suspect had black hair in a ponytail, freckles on her face, and was wearing a black leather jacket at the time. The Boston Avenue area had heavy traffic at the time of the incident, and the Bridgeport Police Department is asking for help in identifying the driver and the vehicle. Anyone with information regarding this incident should contact the Bridgeport detective, Jeff Holtz, at 203-581-5293. An 85-year-old Darien woman was killed in a motor vehicle crash on Route 7 in Norwalk Tuesday afternoon. Seema Sector was pronounced dead at Norwalk Hospital after a crash that happened around 3.30 p.m. on Route 7 southbound between exits 2 and 1 within view of the hospital. Police said a 2014 Honda Pilot SUV traveling southbound on Route 7, also known as the Connector, was struck by a 2008 Honda Civic LX. The Pilot rolled over several times and went over a metal beam guardrail, continuing to roll 75 feet down an embankment. The pilot landed front end down with the rear end wedged against a tree at the edge of the Norwalk River, according to the Norwalk Fire Department. After hitting the pilot, police said the Civic spun out of control and hit a 2008 Ford ECO. The Civic finally stopped in the grass median in the center of the road while police said the ECO landed in the left lane. Spectre was a passenger in the pilot. State police say the driver of a coach bus that slammed into a tractor trailer on I-95 in Norwalk Wednesday afternoon has died. Henry J. Wolfson of Hackensack, New Jersey, was killed when his tour bus carrying 42 passengers rear-ended the truck near southbound exit 14. Wolfson would have turned 32 years old today. Wolfson was extricated from the bus by Norwalk firefighters and transported to Norwalk Hospital where he was pronounced dead. Norwalk fire officials say 19 of the 42 passengers were hurt, but the injuries are not considered life-threatening. Three were sent to Stanford Hospital and 16 were sent to nearby Norwalk Hospital. State police said the bus traveling from Boston to New York City struck the tractor trailer operated in the center lane just north of exit 14. The driver of the truck was not injured. Three lanes of I-95 South were shut down for about four hours, according to state police. All lanes reopened around 9 p.m., about six hours after the accident. Norwalk EMS was on the scene and set up a mass casualty command post due to the number of passengers. Support from numerous surrounding towns was brought in to help assist. 
A 19-year-old Bridgeport man was charged on a warrant Tuesday with four counts of second-degree sexual assault, according to Hearst, Connecticut. Tajay Haywood of Trumbull Avenue in Bridgeport was also charged with four counts of risk of injury or impairing the morals of a minor when he turned himself in at police headquarters. Fairfield Police said they received a report from the State Department of Children and Families in July that Haywood had inappropriate contact with a 13-year-old victim who was known to him. The alleged assaults took place both in Fairfield and Bridgeport. Bond was set at $50,000, and he was scheduled to appear Tuesday at State Superior Court in Bridgeport. Moving now to Milford, an update on their zoning regulations will allow the sale of the medical office building at 199 Cherry Street, giving Stoneham Milford LLC the money it needs to update the shopping center at 155 Cherry Street, where ShopRite is currently located. The Planning and Zoning Board approved the regulation change Tuesday by an 8-1 to one vote. The change will allow for the sale and subdivision of separate parcels and makes the area similar to the shopping center zone. You can read much more at MilfordMirror.com. A Darien man faces charges after police investigated reports heroin was being sold out of a house on Leeds Lane. A search warrant served in August uncovered 21 wax folds of heroin, 2.6 grams of marijuana, prescription medication, numerous cell phones, and $2,000 in cash. Darien police said they had been given several leads that a resident at 12 Leeds Lane had been selling heroin for several months, corroborating statements from Darien officers. The suspects were not arrested on the night of the search, but warrants were applied for through the Stamford Superior Court. 28-year-old Peter Samaha turned himself into police on September 21st after becoming aware of warrants for his, for his arrest on charges of sale of narcotics, possession of narcotics, possession of less than half an ounce of marijuana, and possession of drug paraphernalia. Milford police arrested two people this week on warrants charging them with harassment. One sent messages through Facebook and the other through text messages. On October 7th, police arrested Jamali Sierra, 27 years old, of Bridgeport on harassment charges. Sierra is accused of sending harassing messages to another female via Facebook in September. She was released from police custody on a promise to appear in court on November 3rd. Also on October 7th, police arrested Richard McLaughlin, 47 years old, of House Street in Milford for allegedly sending harassing text messages to a man in August. McLaughlin was released from police custody on his promise to appear in court on November 3rd. To Ridgefield now, where bridge work is reducing Route 35 to alternating one-way traffic near the Fox Hill condominiums, leading to long lines of traffic and short-tempered drivers. There's not much Ridgefield First Selectman Rudy Marconi can do to speed the $2.5 million state project along. It'll take more than a year, and the periodic one-way traffic is expected to last three months. But he has put together a meeting scheduled for Wednesday, October 14th at 7 p.m. in the town hall's lower-level conference room. The public information meeting was called at the request of Fox Hill residents, but anyone interested may attend. Town engineer Charles Fisher said the project requires reducing the highway to alternating one-way traffic between 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. During the morning and afternoon commuter rush hours, work is suspended, allowing for two-way traffic. The plan is to build a temporary bridge on the east side of the highway, and once that is complete, work on the old bridge should be able to proceed without so much disruption. Some 10 to 15,000 vehicles a day were tracked going through the area in the 2005 Route 35 traffic study. The heaviest commuter traffic was tracked at about 1,500 vehicles in the peak morning hours and 1,700 in the peak evening hours, according to the study. The bridge carries traffic over Ridgefield Brook, which flows out of the Great Swamp off Farmingville Road and becomes the Norwalk River. Well, as we move along on your coffee break, let's see if we can get some happier kinds of news, things that would make you want to go out and hit the roads today. Certainly a nice day, but does A.J. Simonowski have good news for us? Let's find out as we step over to the weather desk. A.J., good morning. Good morning, Rob. And for today, I do have good news. Mostly sunny today, currently 64 degrees here in Shelton. High going to get up to about 66, a little bit of a breeze in the afternoon, but nothing to be concerned about. Tonight, partly cloudy, low around 53. That same breeze, but again, nothing 
nothing to be concerned about. Tomorrow, high is going to get up to about 72. Unfortunately, it's coming with a chance of showers before in the afternoon, before 1 p.m., then a chance of thunderstorms between 1 and 3 p.m., and more rain possible after that. Wind's going to pick up in the afternoon there again, up to about 10 miles per hour, so a little bit of wind and rain. Hopefully, we will not get too wet at our football game <laughs> up in Danbury. Uh, new rainfall about uh, could be as much as a quarter of an inch, though the National Weather Service is not entirely sure about that just yet. Rob? All right, AJ, thank you very much. We will pause for a break here, continue on. We've got more news to get to. As I mentioned, Talking Transportation is on the way. AJ comes back with sports. Don will be here with history. We'll look at all of these front pages right off to my right. So lots more to do on a Thursday edition of your Coffee Break right here on the HAN Network. When you experience a sports injury, you want to get better and fast. Coastal Ortho Express gives you direct access to orthopedic care quickly. Their physicians are fellowship trained in sports medicine at world-class universities and are also team doctors for area football teams. For specialized personal care of sports injuries, go to Coastal Ortho Express. Open Monday through Saturday in the iPark building, 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk or CoastalOrthoExpress.com. Coastal Orthopedics, keeping you on the move. Alliance. We are an industry leader in coordinating transportation for large events such as corporate road shows, conferences, and special events. Our team of experts understands the dynamics and logistics of high pressure situations and complex arrangements, all within a rapidly changing environment. Since 1999, we have added charter jets, event management, and personal protection to our range of services. Mention this ad for $25 off your next round trip reservation. Alliance and you. Together, we can achieve the extraordinary. 855-546-6996 or AllianceLimo.com. While the temperatures are cooling down, the fall bite is heating up. Albies, Bonita, Blackfish, Alligator Blues, and Stripers are following the large schools of bait that are abundant in the Long Island Sound. If you love the New England coast during autumn, this is the time to be on the water. The latest from Shimano, Quantum, Avet, Hoagie, Phase 2 and more are in stock and ready to go at the dock shop. And don't mind those fall breezes with jackets, hats, gloves, and fleece from Grundens and Stormer. The dock shop will keep you warm and dry. Boater, beach bum, fisherman, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The dock shop. Now in two locations, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport, or on the web, DocShop.com. It's time to come back to hometown banking, where people are taken into account, not just balances. Where community comes first. A place where there's more than one kind of interest. Where automation will never replace consideration. Where they not only know your name, they know your dog's name, too. It's time to expect more. It's time to bank well. Bank smart. Bank local. Bank well. Welcome back to your coffee break on the HAN Network. Happy to be on Thursday morning. We have reached it. We're almost to the weekend. Of course, AJ had some not-so-great news about the weather, but we will muddle our way through something we won't muddle our way through is history. And that brings me to the gentleman to my right, Mr. Donald Eng. Don, good morning. Uh, uh, limited muddling, uh, so we'll say. Okay, limited. We'll, we'll try, we'll try to, uh, to keep it down. You know, on this day, we first found out how good something was if it made you laugh and cry. But first we go to 1918. Corporal Alvin York single-handedly uh, kills 25 German soldiers and captures 132 more in the Argonne Forest. York had actually tried to avoid being drafted as a conscientious objector. For his actions, he was awarded the Medal of Honor and promoted, and he has gone into history with Gary Cooper's help as Sergeant York. 1956, New York Yankee Don Larson pitches the only perfect game in World Series history. A reporter asked Yankee manager Casey Stengel if this was the best Larson had ever pitched. Stengel answered, so far. For Larson, this was an especially satisfying performance as he, he had acquired a reputation uh, for, for his nightlife more so than a pitcher. Stengel once said of Larson, the only thing he fears is sleep. 1967, guerrilla leader Che Guevara and his men are captured in Bolivia. Guevara remains a revered and reviled historical figure as a result 
of his perceived martyrdom, poetic invocations for class struggle. He has evolved into an icon of various leftist movements. Time magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people of the 20th century, and an Alberto Corda photograph of him, titled Guerrillerico Heroico, that's it right there, was cited by the Maryland Institute of College Art as the most famous photo in the world. 1993, the U.S. government issues a report absolving the U.S. government of any wrongdoing in it in the final assault of the Waco, Texas Branch Davidian compound, The Fire, that ended the siege, killed as many as 85 people, including 23 children. And finally, we go to New York City, 1982. We remember this. Of course, the musical Cats opens on Broadway on this day, 1982. It would run for 18 years before closing September 10th, 2000. The musical tells the story of a tribe of cats, the Jellicles, and the night they make what's the Jellical choice and they decide which one's going to ascend to the Heaviside layer and come back to a new life. It, it's, it's complicated. But anyway, <laughs> Cats introduced the song Memory, which you saw right there, and commercials introduced a generation of New Yorkers to the standard of comparison when something makes you laugh and cry. It's better than Cats. With your look back in history, a trip down memory lane, I am Donald Ng. (laughs) Well played, Donald. I was pretty happy with that. I wrote that and kind of smiled to myself as I wrote it. Does anyone remember the first night of David Letterman when he moved over to NBC and it was uh, Paul Newman who walked into the theater unannounced and looked at the camera and went, where the hell are the singing cats? (laughs) And that's exactly the reference. That's what I was doing while we were watching that video. Okay. Well, see, I see. I can't actually see you, I, 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 even though we're only about two feet apart. It's we, there might as well there might as well be like a, a great wall between us. And of course, I can't let Don Larson get by. Ninety-seven pitches as he shut down the Brooklyn Dodgers two nothing. Uh, Mantle with a home run in that game and a great catch. In fact, Mantle's home run was the first hit of that game. And uh, oh, gee, I can't help but mention that uh, the final out was called on TV by a guy named Vince Scully. There well, you go. What impresses me more is that this was a World Series Game 5, and here we are tonight. We're about to start the first of three rounds of, uh, of playoffs, which is actually, that, that, that's what I found more impressive. That is very true. And by the way, Larson was out all night before the perfect game, showed up at Yankee Stadium, and the old way you found out you were pitching was the ball was in your cleat. He walked in, hung over. Found the ball in his cleat, and the rest is history. He got shelled earlier in that World Series, pitched terribly. Yeah, well, so there's something there's something to be said for that then. 97 pitches, nice and efficient. You know, uh, what's the expression? You pitch like you're double parked? That's, exactly. That That's, was it. That is he the expression. He wanted to get off that mound. Speaking of sports, as Howard Cosell used to say, we go from Donald Eng and we shift right over to A.J. Simonowski. A.J., good morning. Good morning again, Rob. Thanks for Thanks so much. Let's start with some volleyball scores. Ridgefield topped Wilton 3 to nothing. another day for Allie Livingston, another 38 assists and, oh, six service points. Greenwich topped Trumbull 3 to nothing. Darianne over Ward 3 to nothing. Izzy Taylor with the following mouthful of a stat line. 20 kills, 6 digs, 5 service points, 2 aces, and 1 block. And finally in volleyball, St. Joe's topped Griswold, which is on the other side of the state, as I learned yesterday, 3 to nothing. <laughs> In girls' soccer now, Staples topped Norwalk 6 to nothing. Lydia Shaw and Charlotte Rossi each had two goals for the Wreckers. Ashley Wright and Morgan, Morgan McWhorter, I hope I got that right, had one goal apiece. Ward topped New Canaan 3 to nothing. Anna Glovin with two goals for the Falcons. Hannah Allen had the third. Ludlow over Trinity 7 to 1. And Danbury topped McMahon 6 to 2. Over to field hockey now. Norwalk over Stamford 4 to nothing. New Canaan over Ludlow, 3 to nothing. Wilton over Stamford, 4 to nothing. Ward over St. Joe's, 2 to nothing. And Norwalk over Danbury, 5 to nothing. 
No goals scored by the losers in this day in field hockey. And finally, back to the pitch for boys soccer. Staples and Norwalk played to a 1-1 tie. Dan- Darien t- uh, topped Wilton, one nothing. Andrew Matthew with the goal for the, wave, for the Blue Wave. Ward and New Canaan also played to a tie with no goals, 0-0. Ludlow over Trinity, 7-0. And West Hill tied St. Joe's, 2-2. Today's schedule, a lot more soccer happening. Danbury heads to Trinity. Ludlow takes on West Hill. Ward heads to Stamford. Darianne takes on Staples. Ridgefield takes on St. Joe's. Greenwich heads to Bridgeport Central. Trumbull heads to Wilton. And McMahon heads to Norwalk. Long bus trip for the Senators. Only one game in girls soccer as the Stamford Black Knights head down to Greenwich. Field hockey, we got a couple of games for you. Ridgefield takes on Staples, Wilton takes on Danbury, West Hill heads to Ludlow, and New Canaan plays Trumbull. Only one game in volleyball tonight. Harding takes on Central. Since it's girls volleyball, are they is Harding still the presidents or would they now be the first ladies, Rob? <laughs> no, because we can have a female president, they are still the presidents. That is true. Good point. And only one match for girls swimming and diving. Danbury takes on Wilton. And of course, tomorrow night we will be in Danbury to see the Stanford Black Knights take on the Danbury Hatters. Kick off at seven o'clock. Rob Adams and I believe Chris Irway on the call. Pre-game show starts at four with your FC Act Tailgate. Pre-game after that, pre-game part two at five with your FCAC game day. With sports, I'm AJ. Back over to Rob. All right. Thank you very much, AJ. As we come back over here, we've got a few more things to do here on your coffee break on this Thursday morning. Let's jump back in to the headlines. The demolition of the Mercer Coal Fuel Towers at 23 Stratford Avenue in Stratford began Wednesday morning in front of about... 30 residents, media and town officials. Stratford has secured more than $700,000 in grant money for the demolition of the site. In a speech before the wrecking ball's first blow, John Parker said that we have been looking forward to this day since the conference. The spectators expect to give a bang to the demolition process for the value of the proximity to the tracks and chasing properties makes it difficult we still have talk and transportation to talk about on this Thursday morning. We're uh, visiting with Jim Cameron a day late this week, but Jim will be with us here on Coffee Break on the HAN Network. We'll get another look at weather a little bit later on, and we'll continue on for your Thursday morning right here on the HAN Network. school means back to busy and Stewart's market can save you precious time by stocking all of your favorite essentials under one roof for a healthy start to school we have all the ingredients walter stewart's your family-owned fresh local market 229 elm street and at stewartsmarket.com tired of all the bull relax and enjoy the experience of buying a car at Pamby chrysler jeep dodge and ram no bull allowed High Coat Rockefeller Estate is Westchester County's top cultural attraction and is now open for the season. Don't miss out. Go online to HudsonValley.org to plan your visit. Take a drive out to beautiful, sleepy, hollow New York and enjoy High Cut's stunning architecture, breathtaking gardens, expansive art galleries, and commanding Hudson River views. From world-class art by Picasso and Warhol to expertly tended gardens, there's something for everyone. High Coat Rockefeller Estate, a national trust for historic preservation landmark. Have no fear. HAN Network's Fast Frights movie contest is here. Can your film make the cut? Submit your three-minute scary movie today for a chance to win a DJI Phantom 3 drone. Sponsored by Milford Photo. The only thing to fear is missing the deadline. <laughs> I'm Jim Cameron for Talking Transportation, commentary and analysis on getting around. Today, eight little-known truths about aviation 
as shared by pilots and actual flight attendants. Number one, the lavatory doors don't really lock. Yes, they can be opened from the outside by just sliding that occupied sign to one side. This isn't so attendants can catch mile-high club wannabes, but so they can be sure the lavatories are empty on takeoff and on landing. And those ashtrays in the labs, eh, even though smoking has been banned for decades, the FAA still requires them. Number two, oxygen masks can save your life, but only if you get them on real fast. In a rapid decompression at 35,000 feet, the oxygen is sucked from your lungs and you have 15, maybe 30 seconds to get that mask on or die. And the onboard oxygen is only good for 15 minutes, so expect an express ride down to safer altitudes. Number three, airlines are suffering from a pilot shortage. New regulations for increased rest time and more experienced aviators are making it tough for airlines to keep their cockpits filled. Boeing alone estimates that aviation growth worldwide will create demand for a half million new pilots. And just like Metro North, the airlines are now losing their most experienced crews to retirement. Number four, your pilot may be asleep. And actually, that's a good thing during most of the flight, which can be pretty boring as the autopilot runs the plane. And a good nap should make your pilot refreshed before landing. But the FAA is also proposing to test heavy pilots for potential sleep disorders uh, so they don't nod off at a crucial moment. Number five, keep your seatbelt on. Otherwise, unexpected turbulence will see you bounce off the luggage racks like a ping pong ball. So just stay belted in, okay? Number six, flight attendants are not in it for the glamour. They don't get paid when they arrive at the airport or when they greet you on board the plane. For most, their pay starts ticking off only at takeoff. They travel for a living. They have to endure endless abuse for things that are not their fault. And for all that, the median salary for flight attendants is about $37,000. Food stamps they have to apply for separately. Number seven, planes are germ factories. Most older jets recycle cabin air to conserve fuel, so if one passenger sneezes, everyone's susceptible to a cold. The air is also dry, and the blankets and pillows, if you still get them, have not been cleaned since the previous use. The same is true of the headphones they pass out. And that seat-back table in front of you? Just imagine whose baby diaper was seated there when you lay out your in-flight snack. Moral to the story, BYO sanitizer. And number eight, don't drink the water. Unless it comes from a bottle, of course, because water on planes comes from onboard tanks that are rarely cleaned. At least when they use it to make coffee, it's heated. Again, bring your own. Overall, based on passenger miles, flying is the safest form of transportation in the world. But it's not without its risks, some of which you can help minimize using common sense. This is Jim Cameron for Talking Transportation. Thank you, Jim Cameron. Back here on your coffee break. Just about time to wrap it up. But first, we should check on the weather. And then we've still got all these front pages to take a look at. Let's go over to AJ first with some weather. AJ. Thanks again, Rob. Still good news. Still mostly sunny. Currently still 64 degrees outside. Sun is shining. Going to get up to about 66. A little bit of a breeze this afternoon. Tonight, mostly cloudy. Low around 53. Still a bit of a breeze. Tomorrow, possibly rain. But it's going to be warm. So I'll take that. Chances of showers in the early afternoon, possibly a thunderstorm after 2 p.m., new rain between a tenth and quarter of an inch, according to the National Weather Service. But luckily, after that, things clear up. High is going to be in the low 60s for the rest of the weekend into the following week. And your Columbus Day, currently high near 69. And one final hit before I send it back over to Rob. Wanted to update our HAN Network Athlete of the Week poll standings. Kevin Iobi for the Greenwich High School Cardinals still leads the Male Athlete of the Week polling with 33% of the votes. And down for the Female Athlete of the Week, Elizabeth Middlebrook with 28% 
of the votes. Still a couple of days left. Over 3,000 votes cast at this point. If you want to see your, your athlete win, get out there and vote. Rob, back over to you. All right, AJ, thank you very much. And indeed, get that vote going for the Athletes of the Week. We'll name who they are tomorrow on FCAC Game Day. But now we have to turn our attention over to all these headlines right in front of us. Well, maybe not all of them, but certainly some of the things that are jumping out at us as Donald Eng rejoins me and we take a look at the front pages because it is indeed Front Page Thursday. Thursday. Where we'll take a look at what's going to be history next uh, in a year. (laughs) <laughs> It'll be. And what I'm looking at here, we have um, the Shelton Herald, two real kind of disturbing incidents. There are four men charged in a home invasion and with another arrest coming. Uh, that happened um, uh, October 2nd was when the arrests happened. A 52-year-old victim called the police department saying he was beaten up in his driveway by three men. Uh, so four arrests in, uh, in that case. And then another man arrested in an online sting. Uh, Ten people who expected to meet a minor for sex at a home in Fairfield, were instead arrested by waiting by uh, by police. So, um, two uh, disturbing crime stories on the front page of the Shelton Herald. From the Darien Times, a couple of stories by Susan Schultz. First and foremost, Darien police officers arrested for an off-duty gun incident, a story that we highlighted yesterday here on Coffee Break, and a story that really has been uh, a rather difficult one for the Darien Police Department, and certainly a gun incident unlike the headline that I saw from another uh, outlet that basically said a shooting. It was not a shooting per se. It was basically firing at a vehicle, so let's get a little more accurate on that. But in any event, you've got that. And then you've got some signs that are being stolen, recovered, maybe stolen again. Was the mystery solved? Well, it was and then it wasn't. you got to find out more, and it's in the Darien Times. Do this, don't do that? Correct. I'm looking at the Ridgefield Press. Uh, the, 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 The top photo is Scotland School Pinwheels for Peace, planted as part of the Pinwheels for Peace project. Uh, Fifth graders made about 100 pinwheels, and I just like the kicker head world peace. I thought was uh, was 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 cute, and also the and as always, uh, traffic, 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 always a big deal anywhere in Fairfield County, really. Uh, bridge work on Route 35 is all, reducing it to one lane, alternating traffic, uh, leading to long lines and short tempers. And so there's been a special meeting of some various town commissions on that in Ridgefield. Let's go to Wilton now and my old beat at the Wilton Bulletin, checking out what's going on in the schools. Kendra Baker reporting that Miller Driscoll Principal Cheryl Jensen Gurner has announced her retirement, and that will take place effective Thursday, December 31st. So she will step away. And some great pictures from from Brian Hayfley and the story written by Carolyn Rundle Field as it was Ambler Farm Day. And of course, Ambler Farm, quite a great place to go if you're in Wilton or if you're anywhere near Wilton. Stop by and visit Ambler. Ambler, Ambler Farm, very comfortable place to go check out. So good stuff as well, as well as Jeanette Ross talking about the candidates explaining their positions because there will be a new first selectman replacing Bill Brennan. So uh, Lynn Vanderslice and Deborah McFadden making their vision known. Don? Mild stomping grounds, the Trumbull Times. We have two school-related stories where students are really taking an active role in their own education and, uh, and school life. First off, uh, students are rallying to reinstate a 69-year-old substitute teacher who was fired without explanation earlier on this, uh, this school year. Now, uh, he and some of the students have said that, uh, that they think the firing was as a result of some comments he had made about about a Facebook post by the son of a town council member. The uh, the, the council member and, um, and first selectman Tim Herbst have denied that is true. But 1,700 members on the Facebook page to reinstate substitute Joe Rogers. Also, Team Abby. About a, it was a year ago now that um, that young Abby Anderson, a high school sophomore, uh, tragically took her own life after battling clinical depression. And so her family and friends are gathering at Sherwood Island State Park in the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention's Out of Darkness Walk to honor the memory of their former of their classmate Abby Anderson. So uh, great to see kids kind of really, really t- taking ownership. Of, um, of what is a very tough thing for, uh, for anyone to deal with. Uh, a story that I would admit in the Eastern Courier that I'm a little jealous of because I like to ride my bicycle and I can barely ride it five miles, if that. And here's a former Eastonite named Paul Buckley who biked up and down the Carpathian Mountains in Transylvania. 
and raised, well, a lot of money for the European Nature Trust. you got to find out just how much. Nancy Doniger has the story in the Easton Courier, as well as residents airing their various complaints at a selectman's meeting. What's that all about? Again, check out the Easton Courier for more. <laughs> well, I have uh, I have the Monroe Courier, but it was also in a number of other uh, Hersom Network uh, papers. We have a challenger to Jim Himes. Uh, uh, State Rep. John Shaben, who refers to himself as a tree-hugging Republican, has thrown his hat into the ring to challenge for the 4th District seat. That, that includes most of Fairfield County. Also, the Monroe Economic Development Commission is looking for nominations or looking for votes for the town's business of the year. A couple of businesses in town that have been around for over a century in the running for that. So uh, that check that out at MonroeCourier.com. Fine publication, the Monroe Courier. I, it's, it's, it's well edited. It's well written. It's, it's compelling. I like it. To the Milford Mirror now, the, the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals recently denied reopening a recycling facility in town. Jill Dion writing that in the Milford Mirror and, of course, at MilfordMirror.com. And board candidates to discuss the schools from the Board of Education. They'll gather for a public forum next month. And again, that's Jill Dion writing, among various and other things. And the United Way looking to set some higher goals this year. That's at MilfordMirror.com and in the Milford Mirror. Looking at the new Canaan advertiser, uh, Greg Riley with a fascinating story on candidates saying no to a proposed voter forum. The day after the New Canaan League of Women Voters canceled the traditional debates because of a, a debate forum prior to a local election, the majority of candidates who were invited to a replacement forum said they would not attend the new event. Uh, the New Canaan advertiser has invited two candidates for first selectman and uh, seven candidates for town council and a number of other board of ed panel uh, board of ed and other forums to a proposed October 19th event and fewer than half of them accepted the invitation uh, the advertiser also with a great editorial unusually on the front page but it was next to the story that it relates to and i just like the headline your intelligence fails you free speech has lo is lost this has gone too far so uh, politics taking taking the front page in new canaan and that's just a handful of the headlines and front pages that you'll read all throughout our HAN Network newspapers. Great work by everyone throughout the chain. Make sure you read them no matter where you are. Find it online, find it in your mailbox, and find it on your newsstand. With all that said and done, we can start thinking about wrapping up this edition of your coffee break for a Thursday morning. We are back with you tomorrow. But first, don't forget we got to cast our line and jump into the water with the Yankee Fishermen, as well as Arts and Leisure, Sally Sanders and Steve Coulter for Arts and Leisure. John Kovach is the Yankee Fisherman, both of them coming your way later today here on the HAN Network. Tomorrow, we'll be at Danbury High School for coffee break. Kate will be back. I'll be back over in my seat with weather and sports and then getting ready for a lot of football as we get into Friday evening, first at 4 o'clock with FCAC tailgate, and then FCAC game day at 5, and then Chris Irway and I on the call. The Danbury Hatters hosting the Stanford Black Knights in high school football. But that'll do it for your coffee break for Thursday morning. For all of us here at the HAN Network, John Kovach, Josh Fisher, Donald Eng, AJ Simonowski, Eric Gendron directing. I'm Rob Adams. Enjoy your day. It's a beautiful one. Go out there and enjoy it. We'll see you later here on the HAN Network. So long. This is the HAN Network, the leader for local news, sports, arts, and entertainment in southwestern Connecticut and beyond.